Throughout the 19th century, the island colony of Australia was only accessible from Britain or Europe via the longest and most perilous sea voyage known to man. So arduous the journey, so long awaited the destination. Then with brief but violent ceremony, they die within sight of it. Over the past two centuries, the coastal waters of Victorian Southern Ocean, along with the treacherous Bass Strait and the narrow entrance to Port Phillip Bay, which gave way to the burgeoning ports of Melbourne and Geelong, have claimed over 700 ships and condemned literally thousands of souls to a watery grave. Navigating your emigrant, convict or trade-bearing vessel into and through Bass Strait, whether bound for the colonies of Melbourne or indeed the east coast of Australia, was deadly. The greatest danger, however, lay at the western entrance to Bass Strait between King Island and the cliffs of Victoria's Cape Otway. This was known as threading the eye of the needle. To uncover our rich maritime and shipwreck history, we'll travel deep into the notorious waters of Bass Strait, under Port Phillip Bay, and along, maybe even over, Victoria's shipwreck coast. It's going to be great fun. I'm really looking forward to it. A journey of intrigue and discovery as we too attempt to thread the eye of the needle. Through the eye of a needle I was so young and bold I cast off into the wild blue yonder for rivers of gold There was a program going from 1844-1845, the Land and Emigration Program, and the last ship in that batch was a ship called Kataraki. In 1845, the emigrant ship Kataraki was approaching the entrance to Bass Strait in stormy weather, laden with valuable labour for the colony of Melbourne. But the recipe for disaster requires few more ingredients. A ship surgeon pleading with the captain to get into Melbourne before fever breaks out, thus affecting his and the captain's bonus for landing healthy immigrants. An unlit Bass Strait, no lighthouses as yet. And a captain unsure of his ship's position due to the constant overcast conditions and now almost 30 miles off course. You mix these with the powerful currents and the lethal weather that only the Bass Strait can create. The rest is history. That appears to be the case, that the doctor put pressure on the captain to enter Bass Strait when he had clear and distinct orders not to enter Bass Strait at night. Suddenly, the uh, storm comes through, a big southerly buster comes through. Captain says, no, we're shortening sail, we'll ride it out. Surgeon says, I implore you, we must get into Melbourne. I'm really worried about the outbreak possibilities. And she drove on into the night, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, she slammed into King Island. <laughs> They're just clumps of humanity are washed into the surf and their bodies were strewn 30 miles down the King Island coast. For months, those on board these frail, overburdened vessels endured conditions inconceivable to us in the modern era. But sadly, the journey for so many ended here, cast up on this most dreaded coastline. And the voices that once cried like the howling wind as their ship was torn apart from under them now lay silent, entombed in Australia's largest and loneliest mass graves here on this remotest outpost of the Empire. It's incredible. These rocks are like razors. Of the 408 on board, it's no wonder only nine survived. Ten years earlier, the female convict ship Neva, with 245 women, children and crew, was lost in similar conditions on the northern tip of the island. Something had to be done. These lives shouldn't be lost in vain. So Kataraki is the, the trigger for the building of the Great Lights. They should have been built 10 years earlier, but they weren't. It would take 399 lives lost in two nights um, to trigger the building of the Cape Otway Lighthouse. Kataraki is still Australia's worst peacetime marine disaster, but still they came in their droves. I suppose the big question needs to be asked, what would drive a person to bring his family halfway around the world, across the world's worst oceans, in the most appalling conditions, to an unknown land?
The main reason for immigration was uh, an economic one. People could uh, uh, not see much future in Britain, and, and most of our immigrants came from Britain. Some people were, were quite desperate to get away to give opportunities to the next generation. Even though Britain was at the height of her industrial power, she just couldn't absorb the, uh, the unemployed masses. And so they took to the sea, searching for a better life in the colonies of Australia, one they couldn't find in their own homeland. It was said that one emigrated out of hope and not out of despair, and that hope was reinforced in the 1850s when the volume of shipping went from hundreds to thousands a year, with the discovery of something that would change the shape of our nation forever. We dreamed of a land where the rivers were running with gold. Seen as the most significant event in Australia's brief history, the gold rush of the 1850s created an unprecedented wave of emigration. In that decade alone, Half a million people left their homelands in the hope of striking it rich. Upon the discovery of gold, a fast passage was the only thing on the minds of these immigrants, eager to seek their fortunes at the new diggings. The Cape Otway Lighthouse was completed in 1848, three years after the horror of the Katariki, but built in time to safely guide the thousands of ships racing out to the colonies in the early 1850s. Very few of them had ever been on a ship. In fact, uh, Quite a number of them had not even seen the sea. They came from little inland places in, in Britain. And uh, one man I remember reading about, he'd never been on a railway train until he went down to the docks to depart for Australia. Upon leaving Gravesend, the voyage takes you down past the coast of Africa, where you'd encounter the light and contrary equatorial winds commonly known as the doldrums. Here you could be becalmed for weeks in the fetid, sweltering heat below decks, all the while begging for a puff of wind to drive you on. And then the southerly run off the coast of South America before you made your easting down to head through the roaring 40s into the deeper latitudes of the howling 50s. And so we've got these big ships heading way down there, skirting Antarctica and then heading for that eye of the needle where the ice is scraping on hulls that have got immigrants on board and people who haven't even seen ice. And it was just terrifying. The conditions our forebears suffered below decks in steerage accommodation truly defies the imagination. These immigrants must have thought they'd entered some kind of hell on water. I just can't imagine 90 days of living with the same stench, the same foul food, the same frustration if you weren't travelling first class. And of course, an emigrant ship was by no means more comfortable than a convict. With the race to get here on for young and old, it was simply a question of who had the fastest ships. I mean, after all, there was money to be made, mate. To entice the would-be emigrant and charge premium rates for the voyage, some shipping lines advertised fast passage times in high levels of comfort that in reality rarely lived up to their claims. Fierce competition arose amongst the shipping lines to see who could capture the Blue Ribbon Prize for the fastest voyage across the Pacific or the Atlantic. The long passage to Australia was seen as the ultimate test. It might take you 110 days, 105 days, but you'll get here. But the trick was, if the gold is going to run out next week, it may run out, you know, well, I don't want to go on the Roaring Forties. I'll go on the passage that offers me a guaranteed 75 days to, to Melbourne. No questions asked, we'll do it in 75 days or refund a portion of your passage money. Well, which would you take? In this haste to capitalise on the boom years of immigration, a new breed of vessel emerged. It was the dawn of the clipper ship, with graceful lines that cut rather than pushed through the water. They were elegant, lean, and very fast. Few, however, outclassed the great clippers built for the Black Ball Line, who in the 1850s made numerous record-breaking voyages to and from Australia, some of them still unbroken to this day. The Marco Polo, under the command of James Nicole Bully Forbes, made the passage to Melbourne in an unheard of time of 68 days. The following year, he took the famous Black Ball Clipper Lightning back to Liverpool in just 63, a record that still stands. 
Back in the age of sail, these guys were the sporting heroes of their day. They were household names, renowned for their fast voyages, masters of the elements, forcing new passages at even faster times, but usually to the detriment and total disregard of their passengers. Many immigrants kept diaries of their journey, and it's in these diaries we get a picture of conditions both above and below decks. But what was a voyage under the command of somebody like Captain Bully Forbes really like? We ought to petition the captain to keep up less sail, for he sees very little difference between frightening a man out of his wits and killing him outright. Nice bloke, Bully. I would say a young eccentric daredevil is probably how you describe him. There, there are accounts of Forbes standing guard over the halyards, threatening to shoot anyone who wants to take in sail. By his results and reputation alone, Bully Forbes was given his next command, that of probably the greatest clipper ship ever built. Britain wanted to build a, a ship of her own. Rather than being dependent upon America, they wanted to build a a fast ship of their own, and they built the Schomburg. She was the largest wooden sailing ship ever constructed at that time. At nearly 300 feet long, she was capable of raising an amazing 3.3 acres of sail to carry her unique triple-layered, 15-inch thick hull through the waters. She was luxuriously appointed and thought unsinkable. And she is by no means dwarfed by a vessel that's twice her length and 12 times her weight. But ships like Schomburg, they were the Titanic of her day. People were claiming that this ship wouldn't sink, she was triple hulled. This is a safe ship, you know, any iceberg will handle. Premium passages. Well, of course, they were proved wrong. Bully allegedly boasted on departure from Liverpool, hell or Melbourne in 60 days. Well, it's not hell, but it certainly isn't Melbourne either. Bully Forbes, the highest paid and most respected sea captain of his era, was 80 days out from England when, inconceivably, the ship ran aground close to its destination. Luckily, no one lost their lives, but at the same time, no one could believe it. Had it occurred a few miles up the coast in either direction, then it may very well have been a different story. He may indeed have sent a great many people to hell. But the big question remains to be answered, why? Well, it seems to involve a poor passage time, a nervous crew, a disgruntled bully, an 18-year-old girl of questionable character, and a card game that lasted for days. Now, my grandmother was uh, one of his uh, passengers, and my grandmother used to say to me uh, that uh, Captain Forbes was playing cards in the cabin with two ladies and, and the ship's surgeon. And I used to think, well, this was her story. But when I researched it, I found that's just where he was. When his bosun called him from the cabin and he came out on deck, it was too late to save the ship. One of her massive anchors lies as a marker of her first and final destination. But within days of the grounding, the mighty Southern Ocean reduced the pride of the Black Ball Line and that of British shipbuilding to a wreck, along with the reputation of her most accomplished and colourful commander, Bully Forbes. To get through this gateway to the Bass Strait, ship's masters had to somehow gauge where they were, even though Cape Otway and King Island are some 50 miles apart. But when you consider the navigation methods of the time, the term hit or miss was something to be taken literally. Whilst it was the end of their journey, entering these waters was much more dangerous than coming out of the Southern Ocean. And hence the Otway had the reputation of when you saw it, you had to understand that you were still some distance from home and that you were entering dangerous waters. Well, as you can see, the view from up here on the tower is just simply sensational. To have been stationed here when shipping through these waters increased tenfold must have been incredible. And the relief felt by the people on those ships after months at sea when they saw this white tower must have been even more incredible. They'd made it. Or had they? Even with these towers guarding the entrance to the strait, vessels were still at the mercy of the wind and the water of this great southern ocean. It's led to many more wreckings along the coast, some worse than others. 
It's absolutely astounding that more emigrant ships carrying hundreds and hundreds of passengers didn't come to grief along this treacherous coast. In fact, the majority of ships that went down along here were cargo ships. There was one exception, though. A member of the uh, notoriously unlucky lock line. Of 23 ships in the lock line, 16 came to grief at sea. The most famous, of course, being the Lock Ard. And Lock Ard Gorge is just down there. This is the sight that greeted young Captain Gibb through the mists at 3 a.m. on that fateful morning in June 1878. The towering cliffs of Muttonbird Island rising sheer out of the water. Like so many other masters of vessels lost along this coast, he was unsure of his actual position until it was too late. And like so many of them, he perished. And he was so close to making it. As uh, someone said, he handled that ship like a, a racing yachtsman and very nearly got away with it and clipped the end of Muttonbird Island. Where it hit Muttonbird Island, the water is very deep beside it. So once the ship lost buoyancy and was going to settle on the bottom, they didn't have the advantage of it sitting on a reef where they could remain aboard. The vessel was going to sink to a depth of about 20 metres, which is what happened in a very short space of time. Captain Gibbs' fight to save his ship and its company ended here. Tom Pearce, the 18-year-old ship's apprentice, was celebrated for his bravery in pulling 17-year-old Eva Carmichael out of the tumultuous surf. Those two young people had survived, but 52 others had perished on that unforgiving coastline. Beneath the monolith of Muttonbird Island lies the shattered wreck and debris field of the Lockhart. Amongst the piles of rail iron and cement barrels, her broken hull can be seen lying against the reef that tore her open and sank her. Upon the melancholy wreck of the Lockhart, a chord was struck that signalled the passing of an era. Through evaluating the statistics of shipwrecks along the coast, we get a clue to what the major development was in terms of maritime safety, and clearly that was the advent of steam-powered vessels. The Lockhart was the last vessel to bring assisted immigrants to Australia under sail. After that, they came on steam vessels because they were seen to be considerably safer. There was one problem, though, with steam. The vessels seemed to run into each other far more frequently. There were a number um, of collisions, usually with other steamers. On a clear night in Port Phillip Bay, November 1865, the intercolonial passenger ferry, the city of Launceston, was only an hour into its voyage to Tasmania when run down by another steamer, the Panola. Although both vessels were passing on the wrong side of the shipping channel, the captain of the city of Launceston decided to continue on as they were a safe distance apart. The Panola, however, changed course. A last minute attempt by both vessels to avoid a collision failed and despite her engines running full astern, the Panola struck the city of Launceston. Well, the city of Launceston's, uh, I suppose, the 1860s equivalent of the Melbourne to Tasmania ferry. It had a lot of passengers and uh, general cargo on board when it was run over by the Panola and sunk here. Mortally wounded, she began to take in water quickly. The slightly injured Panola transferred all her passengers for a turn to Melbourne, as the city of Launceston slowly slipped beneath the calm waters of the bay. She sank into about 22 metres of water, and despite numerous attempts at the time to salvage her, there she remains. It's a time capsule. It's sunk completely intact, instantaneously almost. All of the passengers belongings, the cargo it was carrying, everything is intact. And from that point of view, it's unique amongst uh, Victorian shipwrecks, at least, and if not Australian shipwrecks. The Panola's collision bow still protrudes from the gash in her side that filled her with water and sent it at the bottom. But the archaeological significance lies in the contents rather than the vessel itself. But getting to it is the Maritime Heritage Unit's greatest challenge. The superstructure on this wreck over the, the years after it was sunk has gradually rusted and if it's wood, rotted away. So it's ended up piled up on the deck in a mound, which is up to a metre deep in some places. The research indicates that the site has about three to five years before it starts breaking apart and spilling its contents and therefore losing its archaeological uh, context. 
for a number of years now we've been looking at the city of Launceston doing some corrosion measurements on it and when we have corrosion underwater there's electric current generated and we can measure that which has enabled us to predict the stern and the bow could collapse so it's important that we get the archaeology done fairly quickly in these areas just in case this occurs preservation conditions on the city of Launceston are remarkable um, in that a lot of the materials were found, the ceramic materials are still actually in position inside the wooden cupboards they were stored in. These delicate ceramic pieces from previous expeditions did not see the light of day from the conservation laboratory for years. The process is painstakingly slow, but nothing compared to that of the maritime archaeology itself. It's not an easy exercise. Limited by visibility conditions of, say, five metres to total blackout and vulnerable to the extreme conditions of the site, members of the Maritime Heritage Unit sift through the silty deposit that has covered and protected the wreck since 1865. However, there are no cannon, valuable coins or gold bullion to be found. Only a porthole into the lives of those who came before us. And that's where the treasure in this shipwreck lies. And in terms of interpreting maritime archaeology to the public, it gives us a, a fantastic opportunity as a time capsule for investigation. Throughout our somewhat brief history, the threat of war or invasion of this outpost of empire was a very real possibility. But back in the sailing days in the mid-19th century, it became obvious we had to take care of ourselves when a fleet of warships from several nations on a goodwill tour came through the heads up Port Phillip Bay and all the way up to Melbourne, much to the embarrassment of the local authorities. It was evident that we couldn't do anything to stop them, even if we wanted to. It was, after all, such a long way to call for assistance if any aggressor, foreign or domestic, had threatened our sovereignty. In the 19th century, our main defence was from shore batteries or from man-made island forts built next to the narrow shipping channel. South Channel Fort here was constructed as part of a comprehensive defence scheme guarding the minefield strung across the South Channel which gave access to the city of Melbourne. However, the colony had already taken delivery of the most advanced warship of her type in the world and this most dynamic reminder of our early naval history is the magnificent Monitor-class vessel HMVS Cerberus. Arriving in 1870, she took her place as guardian of the bay. But she never left the bay, so for all her might and firepower, she never saw any hostile action in her 50-odd years of duty in one form or another. Although she did destroy an empty warehouse with her massive guns during a training exercise. She lies now in her protected zone, rusting and somewhat beyond restoration. The opportunity too late in coming. As we headed into a new century, our mere paranoia turned into harsh reality. By the end of the Great War, the world had become a much smaller place with many nations now squabbling over the size and division of the global pie. And Australia had to consider future enemy action in its southern waters. It became obvious that our coastal defences alone just weren't enough. So after World War I, the fledgling Victorian Navy was given six J-class submarines by Britain as part of a gift fleet when hostilities ceased. But for all their technical advancements and firepower, they were deemed just too costly to run. They were discarded from service in the early 1920s, decommissioned, stripped and scuttled. Lying at 27 metres, the J-4 is the shallowest of her sisters who lie nearby in the ship's graveyard. And our guide proudly displays the plaque laid to celebrate her rediscovery. As we venture inside the broken hull of this once proud fighting machine, the ghostly shapes of her stripped interior appear before us and then open up to reveal the new crew plying the decks. Despite the intention of their design, the J-Class submarines hold a strange beauty as they lie peacefully on the seabed. Their original crew is long gone, their torpedo tubes lying idle. Looking at it from a dive tourism point of view, where else in the world could you dive an entire fleet of World War I submarines? So again, as a group, they have something to say and they're of course enormously significant from our own political and social point of view.
The other submarines that entered our waters did so in the theatre of the Second World War, arriving swiftly and silently and striking without warning or mercy. In times of war, vital supplies and munitions were carried around the world by the merchant navy. And I don't think the average Australian person in those days would realise that at that time the German Navy were operating around Australian waters. Of course, uh, when the Japanese came into the water, it got more serious. A convoy, any convoy in wartime, above and beneath the cruel sea were enemies, U-boats and mines. The Merchant Navy paid a heavy price. The ships of the Merchant Navy were no match for the hidden menace that lay in wait. You made quite clear that uh, no waters were safe at all. You know, rumour went around the ship that there must be submarines around the east coast or in the area. The rumour swiftly turned to brutal reality for the 18-year-old deckhand, for as the merchant vessels Iron Crown and Iron King passed one another in Bass Strait, the Imperial Japanese Navy submarine I-27 fired its torpedo. I was on the Iron King, which was one of these chieftain-class ships, and uh, at that particular time we were passing. That was just a sheer coincidence. We were, we were southbound, he was northbound. My mate John Lowry and I were watching the Iron Crown and, and she was torpedoed right before our eyes. We couldn't believe it. So I went down into the after quarters and uh, I, I said, what, what is it, what is it, what's happened? And I said, get out, get out, you know. We've been torpedoed. And she went down so quickly that we couldn't believe anyone could have survived it. I think I yelled, get over the side, or something to that extent. And uh, I didn't realise that we were going to go so quickly. Well, she was straight down. Yeah, she went down in seconds. I'd say 12 or 15 seconds. There was nothing left of the ship at all. While the Iron King opened fire on the I-27, which had surfaced to survey its handiwork, the broken hull of the Iron Crown disappeared beneath the waves of Bass Strait, taking 38 men with her to the bottom. Only five survived. I was the only one that escaped from down there. I just grabbed the life jacket. I sort of, I don't know, fell down the deck. I half slid down and got onto the side of the ship. And uh, I, I got out. Can you see my hands on the thing? That's how my hands were on the, I'm setting the side. <laughs> I remember that quite clearly. I, uh, we gave the submarine a bit of courage there for a half hour or so and we got away not knowing there were, at that stage, there were survivors off the ship we saw go down. People don't realise that the risks and the courage that Birch and Seaman in wartime, and they lost their lives so suddenly. Could have been one of them myself, but um, somebody must have been looking after us. I'm at Point Lonsdale Lighthouse and over there behind me is Point Nepean and the water rushing by here, and it really is rushing, that's part of the rip. Probably the most dangerous harbour entrance anywhere in the world. Of the estimated 700 wrecks in Victorian coastal waters, an awful lot of them are just out here. There's really only one way to see a shipwreck, that's to uh, go out and get wet. Well, I'm not going to get wet. These blokes are going to get wet. I'm going to stay home and watch it on TV with you. It's quite a sight to see the rip at first hand. It really is a remarkable area, and a fast ebb tide can turn this line between the heads into a solid wall of water as it meets the incoming sea. It's not a bad example of it today. But to see why this area is really so treacherous to shipping, what we need to do is take a look under the waves. The ancient course of Melbourne's main artery, the Yarra River, carved massive underwater canyons where it once met the sea. Today, the tidal necessity to move around 4% of the bay's volume through this narrow entrance creates a maelstrom of violent and unpredictable wave patterns and currents of up to 10 knots. Its waters made more treacherous by the geology over which it flows, for lurking just beneath the surface are deadly rock formations, ready to catch an unwary master. Just out here behind us, you can see the waves breaking on the rocks of Nepean Reef. 
at least you can see them, but a little bit further out, sticking up like a sore thumb to about three metres below the surface so you can't see it, is Corsair Rock. Corsair Rock's one of those things you just wish wasn't there when you're trying to make your way through the heads. The 5,000 tonne freighter River Burnett sinks in Port Phillip Bay after striking Corsair Reef. From our earliest settlement to the mid 20th century, Corsair Rock has consigned more shipping to the bottom than any other submerged object in the area. Its most famous victim being the Royal Mail ship Australia, which struck it in 1904. The ship was stuck fast on Corsair Rock and it was assumed that it would sink into the abyss within, within days or weeks. And some um, local entrepreneurs got together and decided to buy the entire wreck and its cargo for £350. Everybody thought that was silly. It actually ended up staying there for over like six months. And, it's incredible, um, isn't it? And they um, ended up making, through auctions throughout Victoria, £150,000. So it was a good investment. They did very well. <laughs> they did very well. One of its earlier victims the team is preparing to dive on struck the rock but managed to limp into the calmer waters of the bay where she sank just off the main shipping channel. What appears to be a reef is actually the gracefully curved bow of the Eliza Ramsden, now encrusted with over a century of marine growth covering her iron hull. The 46-metre, three-masted bark sank in 1875, and ironically, one of the ship's apprentices was a young Tom Pearce, the only crew survivor, of course, of the Lockhart. And our team cleans the growth off the underwater plinth that informs all recreational divers that visit her of this grand lady's history. Many ships of both sail and steam that attempted this dangerous passage with or without a pilot met with disaster here. The broken hulls of these once magnificent vessels litter the shallow reefs of Point Lonsdale behind me and Point Nepean over there like a, a wreckage yard. How vulnerable to the conditions and mood swings of this area were the wind-powered vessels. The biggest moving man-made objects of their time were sometimes just no match for the rip. Their valuable cargoes of general goods and much needed rail iron litter the shallow reefs on which the battered remains of their hulls lie. And although these wrecks remind us of the dangers ships faced here, countless disasters were prevented by the presence and expertise of the Port Phillip Sea Pilots, who, armed with local knowledge and adept at the characteristics of the rip, guided untold thousands of vessels through the dreaded heads. Port Phillip Heads would be known as one of the worst harbour entrances in the world. It's well known by shipmasters, it's well known around the world, and it's well known by other pilot services in Australia to be a very hazardous area. Well, Charles, here we are on a very calm day. And uh, how would you compare your job today to the job of the pilots in the years gone by? You know, like, I mean, I, be I believe pilots used to actually row out here. The pilot job may have been easier. However, the boat crew's job must have been horrific because they used to row out through the, some of this weather but it's not uncommon to have uh, 10 metre seas coming through the heads at night. Right. Of course, at night you can't see anything, and so all of a sudden the boat might just drop 20 feet. So that's the time when you hang on yeah. or pray. But the most important aspect of our job is to protect the environment and port infrastructure. And the environment being the most important, one of these large tankers that, would, if it touched the rock coming through, Port Phillip Heads would do untold damage to Port Phillip Bay, which would last for many, many years. Uh, bearing in mind, when you bring a large tanker through the heads, the clearance from the bottom is about 0.9 of a metre, and so there's not much to play with. Well, the pilot's gone up the ladder. Look at that. My God. <laughs> and we're away. Suga one from Panama. We just put a pilot aboard that. 280 metres long, which makes it about as long as the Rialto is high. It's a massive structure, and I mean, well, you can imagine the sort of damage that it would do if it hit a rock. So, I mean, what the pilots do is, uh, well, they're environmentally friendly, I guess. It's just not worth 
having an Exxon Valdez all over again, whereas if they'd had pilots on that ship, uh, it would have been uh, much, much cheaper than the billions of dollars they paid out because they didn't. But you only have to go on board these large ships and ask the master whether he'd like to do the job without a pilot, and the answer will be no. So there's no question that at three o'clock in the morning in a howling gale, a big ship comes up to Portfolio of Heads. They want a pilot on board. If it was restricted only to calm weather, it would be simple, but airboats go out in all weathers and day and night, and so it is a very high risk operation. We're in the lee of the Kasuga One at the moment, but you can see how choppy the water is. We're going through the rip now, just dropping back behind the stern. And they're doing 12 knots, as Charles said, which gives them about 0.9 of a metre beneath the boat going through here. It's extraordinary to think that's about, that's all the water there is between it and the bottom. Unbelievable. Now, to give you some idea, this ship that Charles is piloting is only two metres shorter than the QE2. The overseas ships always require a pilot. Because when a pilot gets on board those large ships, he's managing a very high risk operation from outside until the ship is safely alongside the berth. And just like the days of old, ships continue to supply our nation with goods from around the globe. But nowadays, they sail the high seas of tight deadlines, carried along by the tides of commerce with loads inconceivable to those who arrived here with only the wind to drive them. And as the pilot vessel awaits the Arafura in an unusually calm rip, she slips silently through the heads and on to her next port of call, hoping no doubt that Bass Strait will treat her kindly. But that is anyone's guess. And as for the Port Phillip Sea Pilots, well, they'll just keep doing what they've been doing since 1839. And thank goodness for that. I think the sea voyage to Australia had quite a deal to do with the, uh, uh, the Australian ethos. The fact that so many of our forebears, for example, formed together in messes meant working with, with other people. And I think this was transferred to uh, the way of life they were entering. And it was furthered, of course, by those who went to the goldfield working together. And uh, the dedication of the people of that era should never be forgotten. Had the gold rush occurred earlier in Australia's history and prior to the establishment of navigational aids at the entrances to Bass Strait, I think it's reasonable to speculate that there would have been a much higher volume of ships lost along the coasts of both Victoria and King Island. Even with those two white sentinels guarding the western entrance to Bass Strait, I still find myself asking the question, would anyone of our generation endure what our forebears went through to get here? But I must admit, being on board a clipper ship driven by the wind must have been exhilarating. Terrifying, but exhilarating. Sadly, barely a handful of these remain. It was a, a sad time for, especially for the old masters in sail, and one of them wrote, this is a utilitarian age and the race is now all for the mighty dollar. The clippers of the palmy days of ocean going sailing ships have gone, never to return. The beautiful things of life have given place to a class of vessel which is oppressed in every way by dire necessity. And dire necessity is the age we live in now. These leviathans that crisscross the globe reinforce our almost forgotten geographical reality that Australia is still very much an island. In the 1850s, it would take up to four months to get 3,000 tonnes of trade goods here to the colonies. Nowadays, you can get over 100,000 tonnes in one ship in around four weeks. And for those ships that did wreck upon our shores, their cargoes, possessions and artefacts must be respected and left in place for study by present and future generations. People gathering souvenirs are actually doing a tremendous amount of damage to our maritime heritage, they are. aren't they? Part of the maritime heritage unit's role is to be able to educate people in the diving community um, and people in just the general community about our maritime heritage and how we go through a process of protecting it so everybody else can learn from what we learn and that's the role we play in the heritage.
After 200 years and countless voyages, the practice of voluntary immigration to Australia's southern states by sea reached its conclusion in the mid-1970s. First-class migrants who will go to all Australian states. We're glad to have you. Melbourne's piers no longer echo to the sounds of confusion, apprehension or the realisation of dreams to fulfil. That legacy is what we live today. And of those vessels that served our southern shores so well, even those that carried royalty were retired to the depths of Commonwealth Area 3, the ship's graveyard. With the glory days of their service long gone, some 40 vessels were scuttled without environmental concern in the 1920s and 30s. One could suggest rusting in peace. The history lesson that Australia was dependent on the rest of the world in the, the 1800s is a fairly dry old statement. But when students can go to a maritime museum and actually see examples of the material that was being imported by sea at that time, those sorts of things make a history lesson real. And that, I think, is the cultural and social significance of preserving and exploring our shipwrecks. Maritime archaeology can put us in first-hand touch with our past culture, political events, historical events, technical events, in a way that uh, reading about it through the eyes of an historian just can't. And so it's a unique opportunity to not only augment our history, but to make it, to understand it. Our shipwrecks are much more than just morbid curios resting on the seabed. They're, they're unique time capsules. And as we've seen, they each reveal the secrets of their era in their own way and in their own good time. And the expectations of our forebears ring true in their own words, words written in the most desperate circumstances, as they too chance to pass through the eye of the needle. My name is O'Hara, hail from Kildare. This morning I woke to the memory of those who live there. We sail with a lock line And we face the unknown On the ways were like mountains We were wretched and drenched to the bone Like a fool I was captured When stories were told 